So the Yankee lineup again, Mantle in left, Richardson at second base, Maris in right, Pepitone on first, Kubek at short, Fresh in center field, Boyer at third, Blanchard catching, and Stottlemyre the pitcher. And for Houston Morgan at second, Spangler left, Shaw at right field, Vaughn first base, Astromani third, Wynn center field, Lillis at short, Brand the catcher, and Farrell the pitcher. Governor John Connolly of Texas now is all set to fire out the first baseball on the first base side. And he throws it to catcher Ron Brand. And Ron now is bringing it back up to the box seat and handling it to the governor. And there go the Astros out on the field. Well, we're all set to play ball. And here's Mickey Mantle. Mantle, a switch hitter, batting left-handed against Kirk Farrell. Farrell all set to throw the first pitch. And here's the wind-up in the first pitch of the ball game, and it's a ball low and outside. One ball and no strikes on Mickey Mantle, and here's the pitch now by Farrell. Ground ball, base hit up the middle. Jimmy Wynn comes in to make the pick up down, and there's the first hit of the ball game on the second pitch. Cal, I can't tell you what an honor it is to sit in the Dome Stadium with the guy that was a project manager. <laughs> yeah, it's really great being back in here. It's been a long time. We're going to go back in the mind of Tal Smith back in the early days. He's been with the Astros, or been with Houston, really, since the Colt 45 days. And um, we're going to go back in history, and we're going to go start at the opening game of the Astrodome that we're sitting in, in today. In fact, I was sitting, these used to be all yellow seats, and I was sitting here when the great Mickey Mantle got his first hit and his first home run. It was sort of like a New Year's Eve and, uh, and a That's World's right. Fair and a world premiere and, and so on. It was, uh, it was unlike just a baseball game. I mean, there's always something magical about the opening of the season, something magical about having the Yankees here, having Mickey Mantle here. In itself was great, but this building to set it off—I mean, it was—it was a theatrical atmosphere. And Mickey Mantle wasn't the only celebrity. You had the president, President uh, Lyndon Johnson, yep. if I remember, right, and Governor Conley, right, and all the city council people. Right. And you had a great right. uh, uh, pregame festivities it, down the field. It was a place to be. It was a tough ticket. Everybody, regardless of their interest right. in baseball, wanted to be here to see the first game played in the Astros. I'm going to read a little bit from that day, and then we'll move on. Yankees manager Johnny Keane put Mickey Mantle in the leadoff spot so he could have the honor of being the first to bat in the new Astrodome. Of course, our Hall of Fame announcer Gene, Aust Gene Elston was announcing. Mantle responds with a single up the middle on the second pitch of the game off the Astros ace Richard Turk Farrell. The Mick also became the first player to hit a home run in the new indoor dome stadium with a center field solo shot in the sixth inning off Farrell. That homer was the only Yankees run and they lost on Astros pinch hitter Nellie Fox with run scoring single in the bottom of the 12th inning. Tell us about your re re reflections of the great Mickey Mantle. Oh, Mickey Mantle, he was, uh, you know, he was he's still in the minds of many uh, people who want a successful businessman, retired people today that, uh, that uh, still will talk about Mickey Mantle. They just absolutely idolized him. Uh, he was a great talent. Uh, obviously playing in the, uh, as it stands on the world's greatest stage at that time in New York. And uh, one on matinee idol with, with his good looks, his boyish uh, charm, his great physical attributes, uh, his personality, and, and why not, uh, he, was, uh, he, he was an outstanding athlete, obviously. He could run, he could hit with power. He, he, was, uh, he was the epitome of the classic five-tool player. But to have Mickey Mantle come in here for the opening, and the Yankees, and have him come in for the opening of, uh, uh, of the Astrodome was really special. And they were the American League champions the year oh, before. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. Well, M Mickey uh, is hold a, you know, in, in memorabilia today. I mean, Mickey went around and signed at various parts of the country all the time in his retirement years and whatever. But even today, a Mickey Mantle ball or a picture or something like that just is just... I mean, that's it. Well, you I mean, still hear stories of people like Bob Costas, and one not, uh, who, right, uh, who right. in his own right is a, is a, is a famous personality and a, and a great sports broadcaster, right. and he still carries a Mickey Mantle card around with yeah. him. I think in the last college classic that we had, um, uh, one of our fellow board of directors, Randall Swearingen, had a Yankee uh, deal behind home plate and everything like that. It was a big room, right. and he put his Yankee right. memorabilia, his right. motorcycle. Yep. I think I you were there. That. I, I think remember you were that. There. It was a great exhibit. And, and, and he's one of our deal, and he handles the Mantle family's website. Yeah. Okay? Right. And uh, we'll hear a little bit later from Randall in the program tonight and everything like that. But let's move on. Let's yep. move on. Let's go to um, 
uh, a couple of Houstonians we're honored tonight. Sure. Okay. Yep. Uh, one of them's Ron Maffridge. I think oh. your, your paths have crossed. I think y'all were uh, board directors I know on the Ron. Make a Wish. Ron? I know Ron very well. We served on the Make a Wish board together for several years. Uh, just an outstanding person uh, who has uh, who has done so much for Make a Wish and so many charities and. Uh, and uh, one of, and uh, and the interest of the city at large. Uh, he's a, he's a most deserving guy. He's a good guy, and certainly most deserving for all he's done in a very low key way. Well, he's very generous, and he, as you as you stated, and uh, at one time he was on 16 charity boards. I can tell you no, that. Not, just I a can, little secret deal yep. there. We're going to uh, uh, see Ron later in the program, whatever, and he's going to be introduced by Dr. Jim Gatner at, at uh, Sam Houston State. He's a big uh, philanthropist for Sam Houston State University. Well, certainly a great, great choice, guy. most deserving. Another guy that's crossed paths yep. with you, and we'll go into this a little later when we when we talk about the new park. But Jack Rains, the yep. Republican right. uh, fundraiser for Ronald Reagan in the state of Texas. Right. Secretary of State, but you crossed paths with him when he was the head of the Houston Sports Authority. They played a key role, certainly, uh, one in his role when he was heading up the Sports Authority, and the, and uh, and uh, you know it was a joint effort, obviously, uh, bet between Drayton McLean, the Sports Authority, the city, and one a number of people to get our ballpark downtown, Minute Maid Park today. Uh, to get that done, and Jack Raines was uh, serving a very important role and certainly helped uh, bring about what today is a beautiful ballpark. Now, I've heard this. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, I've heard this from several different sources and all that. It was the only major facility in this country brought under time and under budget. Well, it was brought in on time or certainly, uh, certainly within time and under budget, and uh, I think that claim uh, it would be very difficult to refute. I am not aware of any others that can make that contention or there that claim. Go. All right. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to go to uh, to your award right now. Okay. And the reason that I entice the board of directors to go to Tal Smith, of which you were so gracious to put your name on it, because I remember the early years in uh, Colt 45s. It really started Colt 45s, really, in Astros. Uh, you were a conduit in this city from amateur baseball to professional baseball, and very obviously you were in professional baseball. But uh, there's a friend of mine that's deceased now. His name is Leo Galnick. He was one of your closest friends Absolutely. in the world. You, yep. You've eaten lunch with him a million times. Right. I know that. And right. I know how Lee spoke of you. He had the same type of uh, admonition to you. And, 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 and I want you to talk about Leo Galnick. He formed that Carl Young League. I played in it. In fact, I was the first all South Coast Converse guy that played in it. And then Leo Galnick was in my wedding. And I've been married to my bride for 30 years. So that's how much he means to me. <laughs> but uh, tell us yeah. about Leo Galnick. Well, I can remember that like it was yesterday, and uh, one out at that time, and that was uh, after the Astrodome had opened, obviously, I want to say 1966, 1967, that era, and at that, that time I was uh, serving as Director of Player Personnel, for, and I can recall distinctly Lee Galnick uh, called, wanted to have a meeting with me, brought a couple of, uh, of his associates with him, and, uh, and uh, talked to me about uh, his idea of doing something to uh, foster uh, stands the development of the of the college player in the Houston area, and uh, he talked to me about his about his idea that uh, that ultimately became the formation of the Carl Young League, and uh, why not? And I, I I told him we fully supported it. I thought it was a great idea, and I'd do what I personally uh, could. And uh, as, and uh, from that standpoint, uh, we we helped with equipment and. Uh, and uh, had a number of meetings with Lee and his board to get this thing off the, off the ground and try to contribute where we can uh, some of the physical resources that they needed to help get it done. Well, you did more than that. I, mean, <laughs> I know that I was there in the young days and all that. Uh, the Carl Young League, uh, you, you're going to be presented today by Lee Gal Galnick's uh, younger son. I don't know if you yeah. know that or not, but we're but, looking forward uh, to that. People sometimes fail to focus on the fact that when, I, when, when they're looking at a major league ball player, at a Mickey Mantle, or at our present stars today, whether it's a Roy Oswalt or Lance Barkman or, or uh, Carlos Lee or anybody, and one, one, how did they get where they are today? There are hundreds of thousands of kids playing high school and college baseball. How do they get into professional baseball? How do they get to the big leagues? Somebody had to make an assessment or a judgment of their talent, and that's the scout, the professional scout. And for the most part, he's an unsung hero in this game today. But he's the guy that makes it possible. He's the one that goes out and finds a, a Josh Beckett, a Jeff Bagwell, a Craig Biggio, or so on, and that, uh, and that makes a recommendation to an organization to sign them and to develop them within their system. 
and uh, it's it's the same thing not only at the amateur level but obviously in the minor leagues uh, when when trades are made when the Astros uh, trade for a Jeff Bagwell many years ago from Boston uh, one that stands the credit uh, sometimes uh, goes to people sitting in the in the home office and frankly they hadn't seen the player they're dependent upon the judgment upon the evaluation of the hardest working people in the game today and that's the professional scout well I'm glad you said that because your award is going to go to the top area professional scout and that's Randy Taylor of the Texas Rangers who coordinates all the area code games and, and, and all that stuff I've seen him work for years right. and he's a Houston boy that went to Spring Branch High School so so and he is so honored to have your award and we'll see that a little bit later Hal, I, I love you I'm, I'm gonna make you say one more thing on camera the, I'm gonna make you repeat something that you said to me in your office when I came to talk to you about putting your name on this award and by the way for everybody out there uh, um, Dal Smith accepted that in two minutes. Uh, I don't know the respect for the RBI Foundation or what we're trying to do. He was at our dinner the year before, and I'm so, so very appreciative of it. But I'm going to make you make you repeat that, okay? And it's about Josh Beckett today. <laughs> so I want you to say it on camera in front of everybody so you know, so everybody knows. So well, as, as, as I said, scouts always have to, have to put their name on the line with, with judgments and assessments. And I can recall, uh, even in my present role, I still enjoy going out to see some of the some of the better Absolutely. better better high school and college players. And I had heard about Josh Beckett. I wanted to go see him myself, and I went out there and I came back and I told Drayton McLean the next day, and I told several other people that is the best high school prospect I have ever seen. There you go. That's so. on record right there. So we'll have to have Josh Beckett keep having the years he had last year, yeah. and then that'll make that come true. Um, I guess this goes back to your opening days in Major League Baseball when you were in Cincinnati, I would think. But go ahead and talk about uh, the, the hills and the terraces of, of old time. Yeah, well, I think one of the interesting things about baseball parks is the fact they're not uniform. Football fields are regulation of 53 and a third by 100, and the same basketball courts are regulation. Obviously, the setting is a little bit different. And one, but baseball fields have their own characteristics as far as field dimensions and uh, one not uh, as, as uh, you know as to how far it is down the down the lines and center field and so on and so forth. And during the design stages here, in the very early stages, when 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 this was still in the in the in the in the early early drawing stages, uh, Drayton McLean uh, had a meeting of all the uh, people involved, the architects and engineers from HOK and uh, and our staff with uh, Bob McLaren and Pam Gardner and myself and Rob Matwick and others. And why not? And uh, Drayton is always challenging uh, people. What what can we do to really make this different and exciting and interesting and so on? So when it came to the field characteristics, uh, I guess as a result of my seniority, so to speak, from a standpoint of years, and uh, why not? They uh, they asked. Uh, you know, they they sort of turned to me, and I talked about some of the things in major league pulp in, uh, in major league ballparks. Obviously, the vines at Wrigley Field and the the green monster at Fenway Park, the monuments at Yankee Stadium, and so on and so forth. And I talked. About uh, about embankments or terraces, and uh, one that obviously Cincinnati. I started my 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 career there at, uh, when the Reds were playing at Crosley Field, and in those days there was an embankment in left field, went all the way around the center field. At one time it would stretch the entire outfield, but when I was there it was left field. Frank Robinson, Sam was a left fielder, and uh, and uh, when I saw I talked about that, and I also also told him that from a historical standpoint, uh, Fenway Park in Boston, one of the one of the great all-time ballparks. Uh, that that had uh, that had a terrace, so that was, uh, that was that was called Duffy's Cliff, after Duffy Lewis, who was a left fielder, and with Tris Speaker and Harry Hooper, and uh, well, so anyway, uh, the uh, and the architects uh, uh, one that uh, sort of sort of liked the uh, the idea, the novelty, and they uh, they included that in some of the early drawings of the, of the field dimensions, and we talked about the flagpole being in play as it uh, as, as it had had been at Tiger Stadium in Detroit from. Uh, th throughout th uh, throughout history, and when I, frankly, I never expected the hill to survive. I thought somebody, someplace along the line, would say, "Ah, we don't need that." But anyway, it survived, and, and here it is. And obviously, it's one of the characteristics uh, that helps make uh, helps make Minute Maid uh, what the beautiful ballpark it is, and it becomes uh, something that uh, distinguishes Minute Maid from the other major league ballparks. Now, can you answer me a question? Uh, when we did the tape at the dome, I had you sit on the left. Do you know why? Uh, not precisely, no. Because I knew we were coming to Towels Hill, and I want you to be <laughs> taller than me. That's right. All right, there, there's your deal. Okay. We're on Towels Hill. We couldn't have an interview with this great man without ending it right here.